Hi, Tim. Hello. Hey, Marissa. President Mims, we are currently live streaming. Hi, Kelly. Hello. Hi, Kelly. <clears throat> we are currently well. live streaming. I anyone not coming, Marissa? Not that I am aware of. I see we're missing Rebecca and Elena, but I have not heard that either one would not be able to join us tonight. Okay. <clears throat> I'll start right Rebecca, on time. Rebecca, we are live on YouTube. Okay. Oh, there's Rebecca. Okay. Seem to be frozen here. You're frozen. I hear you. No, no. No, nope. you're moving. You're okay. Yeah. Mary, is Mandy with Just you? Fine. Is Ma is Mandy with you? Just ahead her dinner. Um, Mary. Like like John Heilman's um, Great Danes. <laughs> I'll bring her in. I'll I'll have her join in, in a minute. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I will call the meeting to order at this time. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United flag States of America, of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, which stands one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice, for all. justice for all. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the approval or revision of the agenda for this evening. Is there a motion to approve or approve the agenda for this evening? So moved. Thank you, Daryl. Second, I believe from Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. 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 And I don't see anyone who's going to oppose or abstain. Uh, next item on the agenda is the public hearing for the budget. Uh, Assistant Superintendent Furlog will present the budget and that will be followed by a public hearing. Superintendent, excuse me, Assistant Superintendent Furlong. 
Uh, this is Superintendent Tice. I'll begin by just uh, reminding the board we thank you for your support. Uh, it was certainly an arduous process this year. Uh, uh, certainly pandemic uh, threw a monkey wrench into things and will continue to do so uh, in the year ahead with the governor having the authority to make mid-year uh, cuts to our state aid. That being so, uh, we have crafted a budget, as you know, the board adopted the proposed budget uh, back on April 20th. And the budget is based on uh, our strategic plan. In fact, early on, uh, as you can see, our mission and vision were core elements to that uh, plan. In particular, as you know, the four priority areas or four core organizational values, which include teaching and learning, positive school environment, supportive community partnerships, and fiscal capacity and responsibility. And we take our responsibility to the taxpayer very seriously. That being said, our accomplishments are many for this, our strategic plan and for the budget going forward. We would like to continue our innovative teaching uh, practices. We've improved student agency, uh, the work of the entire district uh, to promote more voice and choice, the use of the curious classroom, in particular at the elementary levels, have helped include book studies, flex time, maker spaces, wonder walls, and genius hours, as well as STEM learning. Our uh, Agents of Change class at the middle school level allows students to con conceptualize their own project, to carry it through to completion, and to present their results to an authentic audience of their peers and adults. In the area of positive school environment, our accomplishments included the Big Read this year, uh, coordinated on the book, uh, How to Raise an Adult. This also included a guest speaker from Syracuse University. We've added a therapy dog at the high school, and we've worked on mindfulness Second step to augment our character education programs, the Positivity Project at the middle school and high school level. This also included homeschool liaisons, which work to help engage families who might otherwise find it difficult to engage with the school district. We've continued our work in support of community partnerships in terms of promoting network and advocacy and working together with other future focused schools as part of the AASA collaborative, as well as participating on the Tri-State Consortium and sending a number of our faculty and administrators for training and to participate on consultancies in order for these high-performing districts to share best practices with one another. And then finally, as I turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Furlong, in terms of fiscal capacity and responsibility, our fourth but not least priority area in terms of our work on long range fiscal plans, budget workshops, as well as our work on the facilities committee to not only turn over new facilities at the high school library media center and Enders Road Elementary classroom, but also to gear up on the construction project at Wellwood, which is currently underway. Mr. Furlong, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tice. Uh, this next slide is a general overview of the budget for the 2021 fiscal year. Uh, first and foremost, the preliminary budget uh, maintains or enhances all existing programs for our students. Uh, this budget also uh, reflects an ongoing operations increase of 2.02% and a resulting tax levy increase of 2.24%. In addition to the baseline budget, New debt from recently completed building projects at the high school on Enders Road increases the overall budget by 0.8% and the tax levy by 1.09%. This budget, uh, while this budget reflects a conservative approach, uh, there is significant concern that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will negatively impact uh, New York State finances and therefore negatively impact state aid that we receive from New York State. As for the revenue side of the budget, the one thing I wanted to note was that um, the legislature has given the governor uh, authority to make mid-year reductions to our state based upon any shortfalls that New York state revenues have. Um, 
This is concerning because this has never happened before where uh, there is a potential for state aid cuts mid-year. Uh, the other thing I do want to mention is that the tax levy increase is currently at the tax levy limit, and we'll go through that calculation in a few slides. This next slide shows the line-by-line -line, uh, comparison of state aid that we received. Uh, instead of going line by line, I just wanted to really highlight two lines here. The first is foundation aid. You can see that foundation aid is virtually frozen at the current year level. It's actually a decrease of $9. Uh, if you look at the bottom line, there is a new category called pandemic adjustment. And this reflects what state aid uh, decrease we are anticipating, which is $670,000. The next slide shows the uh, tax levy limit calculation. And while most people refer to this as a tax cap or a 2% tax cap, it's really a multi-step calculation. And there's three main factors that impact our tax levy limit for this next year. First is the consumer price index or inflation. Um, basically our uh, inflationary factor is 1.81%. On top of that, we get a taxable growth factor, which really reflects growth in um, real brick and mortar growth in our tax base from new construction. And this is a little bit less than half a percent at 0.43. Third and lastly is the capital exclusion. And this reflects uh, voter approved building projects, uh, specifically the Faithful Elementary building project, the high school building project and Enders Road and that capital exclusion is increasing our tax levy by 1.09%. <clears throat> so to summarize, the tax levy limit is a, a tax levy increase of 3.33%. Uh, the resulting tax levy will be $65,592,550, which is an increase of slightly more than $2.1 million. As a frame of reference, the uh, tax levy increase in the last two years were 2.94% and 3.67% respectively. As indicated before, that 3.33% reflects an increase of ongoing operations at 2.24% and 1.09%, which reflects the local share of debt with those recently completed building projects. I think it's important to note that <clears throat> At the current time, the tax rate increase or the, the rate that people actually pay is conservatively estimated to be less than one half a percent, one half of one percent. This equals $12.74 on $100,000 of taxable value, which is a very modest increase. The next slide is all other revenues and outside of you know, state aid and the tax levy, uh, we don't get a lot of revenue, uh, relatively speaking, but this is a kind of a line-by-line -line listing of the revenues that we do get. The next slide indicates the uh, overall revenue summary, and we like to compare you know, uh, this on a percentage basis, and you can see that state aid represents a little bit less than 23% of our overall revenue. Meanwhile, the tax levy is more like 74%, a little bit more than 74%. I know it's tough to see on the slide um, on the computer screen, but if you looked at the overall revenue trend, which is specifically that chart on the bottom right hand side, <clears throat> you'll notice uh, over time that the uh, percentage that local taxpayers are paying is increasing. And that's mainly due to the fact that over time, our state aid has been relatively flat um, in comparison. So since we're not getting as much state aid, uh, you know, really that is shifting more of the burden onto the taxpayer. <clears throat> as for the expenditure side of the budget, <clears throat> there are several main cost drivers uh, for this next year. Uh, the second bullet is probably the most uh, significant uh, outside of the new debt and that is uh, that health insurance premiums are going up by 6%. The next slide uh, indicates the, uh, the increase in the debt from those recently completed building projects. 
Uh, overall, debt is increasing by almost $600,000. We do get building aid on that. Uh, we get about a little bit more than 70%, it's about 72% building aid uh, on that debt. So we will see an increase in, uh, in building aid next year. So the next slide, uh, you know, we, we don't usually talk too much about the current year. But uh, this has been the most unusual year. And we're, because we're not operating like we normally would, we're seeing some significant savings. Um, and those areas are listed here. Uh, you know, we saw savings in substitute pay, coaching salaries in the spring season, diesel fuel costs are way down. Actually, they were down under a dollar for a brief period uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, utility costs are down, uh, sports and field trips through our transportation department uh, were not needed in the spring, uh, spring season. Uh, we did save money on school resource officers because we weren't operating like we normally do and also on- Across Bill. Marissa, is it me or is it Bill? I don't have any audio either. Bill, you're muted. Sorry, um, is it, I think it's just Bill. I can hear everyone. Yeah, I can't hear Bill. <laughs> Bill, can you speak up? Yes, can you hear me now? There we go. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes. Where did I lose people? Did I speak to the three proactive measures that we were taking? We lost you at operational savings. Okay. So on this slide, there are operational savings that we're, we're seeing in the current year. Uh, and they are listed here at the bottom of the slide. Um, you know, one of the three proactive measures that we are taking to minimize the impact of mid-year state aid reductions is to uh, save as much money as in the current year. So we can help offset any uh, state aid reductions next year and any potential budget cuts that we might have to have next year and the year beyond. The next slide is a listing of the reductions that are included in the current budget for, uh, for the proposed budget for 2021. Uh, those reductions include uh, not taking a census this summer uh, the district has taken a census for many, many years, but we felt that uh, that was, you know, an expense that we didn't need to occur, incur, and we didn't feel it necessary to send employees uh, to everybody's front door, uh, given the, the current circumstances. Uh, we're also looking at reducing transportation supplies and materials. Uh, we typically hire some summer seasonal work in the custodial and maintenance area and we're going to not be doing that hiring. Uh, we're also looking at across the board uh, reductions in field trips and athletics. Uh, we're also looking at reducing the number of bus aids we have this next year. And we've taken a hard look and eliminated some of our BOCES services. We are seeing some uh, reductions in instructional staffing due to attrition. And we're also looking at reducing some of the arts and education uh, expense that we incur through our BOCES. On top of the half million dollars that we've already uh, reduced the budget, we're also looking at potential budget reductions. These would only be uh, implemented if our state aid was cut. If New York State came down and said that we needed to, or we were going to receive less state aid than what we have built into the budget. Mm -hmm. We have put together a list of $1.1 million worth of items. And while these items are currently budgeted, we are not planning on spending any of it until we get a better picture of what our actual state aid will be uh, during this next year. Uh, but here's a list of the items that we have um, listed as potential budget reductions. Uh, the vast majority of them occur in our support staff areas, um, you know, custodial and maintenance and transportation. Uh, but we're also looking at areas of what I call discretionary spending.
spending on supplies and conferences, furniture and equipment. We have made across the board reductions in uh, supplies and conferences, and we really put any non-discretionary uh, purchases of uh, furniture and equipment on hold. Uh, we are listening, looking at some uh, slight staffing reductions due to attrition, um, both in the non-instructional and instructional area. The next two slides uh, are the instructional program uh, budget line by line. Uh, New York State uh, requires school districts to present their budget in what's called the three-part format, those three parts being instructional program, administration and capital. Uh, the first two slides are in the instructional program. Uh, the only one area that I do want to highlight is on the second page, and it's the second line, which is special education. Uh, you can see that special education is decreasing uh, by almost $600,000. Uh, this is really, there's two reasons behind this. Uh, first and foremost was that a year ago when we built the budget, uh, there was a number of students who were enrolled in a, a fairly expensive BOCES program. Uh, those students left the district before the start of the current year. So we adjusted the budget downward to um, account for that. In addition, there are also a number of students that were um, enrolled in the current school year that will be leaving the district next year. Uh, so between those two reductions, uh, we did see uh, significant savings in the special education area. But it's not to say that we're reducing any of our existing programs. It's just reflective of the student population in that area. <clears throat> the next line or next slide is the uh, expenditures related to the administration portion of the budget. And uh, the one thing I did want to note on this was the overall increase of 25,000 is fairly uh, fairly minimal. There are some changes, and you'll notice that Board of Education is increasing by about 34,000, and meanwhile the business office is decreasing by almost 64,000. There is a shuffling of expenses. Um, one of the areas that um, we wanted to break out was the district clerk expenses, and that's included in Board of Education superintendent line, where in the past that was included in the business office line. So, you know, much of that increase on the Board of Education superintendent line is really just a transfer, and you can see that the business office expense is actually down. The next slide is the uh, capital portion of the budget, or next two slides. And basically, we, we broke the capital portion of the budget into two parts this year. Uh, one was to show the ongoing operations and what the cost of those operations look like. And this first slide shows that ongoing operations is actually decreasing by almost $300,000. Uh, most of that is in the operations and maintenance. Um, some of it's related to utilities, some, is, some of it's related to staffing. Uh, but that is an overall reduction. Um, one of the line items on that slide is called slide. It explains what that means. Uh, transfer to capital is a budgetary appropriation that is used to fund limited scope cash flow projects. We, we basically have set aside about $450,000 over the past several years. And, um, you know, in the current year, we're using it to um, improve security at Fayetteville Elementary, and also uh, to set up a separate and distinct electrical service at Fayetteville Elementary as well. For this next uh, budget cycle, we're taking the 450,000 and we're planning on repaving as much as Pride Lane as possible, and also do some limited security work at the high school. And in addition to that, we're also planning on starting the carpet replacement in classrooms at Enders Road Elementary. The next slide is the rest of the lost audio again. I think. Uh, yeah. Sarah, we can't hear Bill. You see that? 
The next portion of the budget is, or next portion, or next slide is the uh, capital portion of the budget related to voter approved building projects. Uh, as you can see that we have long-term debt increasing by about 600,000. And we also have some anticipation notes that are helping financing the debt of 167,000. But once again, this, uh, these expenditures are also driving building aid, which increases our revenue. The last uh, slide related to expenditures is really the uh, employee benefits portion. And as I mentioned before, the most significant increase is in health insurance premiums, and that's driving an increase of uh, $940,000 this next year. So in summary, um, you can see that the overall expenditure summary shows an increase of ongoing operations of 2.02%. If you add in the uh, impact of the capital uh, projects that were recently completed, the overall budget is increasing by 2.82%. Also on the uh, ballot this year, as with other years, is the school bus replacement proposition. Uh, we will be seeking approval on the purchase of five replacement school buses four are full-size 71 passenger buses. The other is a uh, shorter 35 passenger bus. Uh, the total cost of that bus purchase will be $681,000. Uh, it will be financed over a five-year period. Um, we do receive state aid on the purchase of those buses at approximately 72.5% of the cost of both principal and interest. Uh, therefore, the annual cost is a little bit more than $38,000. Now, if those buses were approved for purchase, they would not have an impact on next year's budget. The first financial impact will actually be in the 21-22 school year. So, in summary, uh, once again, the budget maintains or enhances programs for our students. Uh, probably the most significant impact on next year's budget is the recently completed building projects at Fayetteville Elementary, High School, and Enders Road. Uh, because of the uncertainty over uh, state aid revenue, uh, we have uh, made certain budget reductions, and we have also created some contingency plans for further budget reductions if need be. Uh, while we've made uh, provisions for budget reductions, uh, those budget reductions really don't have any direct impact on the programs that we are offering for students in the 2021 school year. And with the budget increasing by 2.82% and the tax levy of 3.33%, that which people actually pay their tax bills we're looking at an estimate of less than 0.5%, and that will increase uh, $12.74 on $100,000 of taxable value. I'll now turn it over to uh, Dr. Tice to talk about the budget vote and board of election or board of education election. Thank you, Mr. Furlong. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, the budget vote date is June 9th. 2020, all ballots must be received by 5 p.m. may be mailed or they may be dropped off in the secure ballot box that is at the front, at the front entrance of the district office. The ballots and the district newsletter have been mailed out. We have received questions on the governor's executive order so all voting will be done by absentee ballots. There will be no in-person voting this year. We have We've lost you again, Dr. Tice. Voter list, and then compare it with the bold systems list of our voters in the past few elections, 
because we operate with qualified voters. So we have endeavored to get those absentee ballots out to everybody. Uh, the bold systems allowed us to add voters that may not have been registered, but did vote in our election as qualified voters. So we have tried to put forth a good faith effort to get those absentee ballots out, uh, but we are still fielding some requests for absentee ballots. They must be received, as I said, by 5 p.m. on June 9th. That concludes our presentation at this time. We do have four candidates running for the Board of Education, two incumbents and two challengers. Uh, that information has been placed on our website, as well as uh, sent to the Eagle Bulletin for publication. We are... Uh, oops. Marissa, you're talking, but you're on mute. Sorry, Dr. Tice, you said four. Isn't it five people who are running? Four, four individuals for the Board of Education for three spots. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so at this time, I'd like a motion. I'm sorry. Nope, you go ahead. So I didn't know if I was cut off there. Uh, you're, you're coming in and out a little bit. Right now, I can't hear you. No. Craig, whatever you're saying, we can't hear. I don't think you can hear us either. Nope, still nope. can't hear you. Looks like your audio is trying to connect now. Got to check. Dr. Teich? Yes, I'm here. There you are. Okay. 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 Uh, we have four candidates uh, running for three spots on the board is where I was before we left off. We have uh, submitted those biographical sketches to the Eagle Bulletin, and we have posted them on our website uh, for review. The last couple of elections, we did, were uncontested, and so we made the choice to honor the voter feedback in our exit survey for more detail on the budget, in addition to the articles on the accomplishments. So we have tried to direct everybody to the Eagle Bulletin, as our official newspaper and or the uh, district website. How's that, did that come through? Good. That concludes our presentation and I'll turn it over to you, Madam President, uh, to begin the hearing. Thank you, Dr. Tice. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Furlong. Um, is there a motion to open the budget hearing? Thank you, Rebecca, second from Tim. Any discussion? Okay, we will now open our, excuse me, open our budget hearing for questions regarding the budget. Um, Sarah, did we have any questions submitted? Yes, we do. Okay. Can you hear me, President Mintz? I can hear you. Okay, we have a comment from Tim Swanson. With the unprecedented possibility for mid-year cuts, how might that affect building aid and projected aid for new buses? I don't know if everyone's heard that, but it cut off a little bit from me. Could you repeat it? Yes, I can. With the unprecedented possibility for mid-year cuts, 
how might that affect building aid and projected aid for new buses? It's my understanding that uh, if they do make aid reductions during the middle of the year, they won't be to any specific aid category. So it wouldn't affect building aid directly or it wouldn't in fact uh, affect uh, aid that we would receive on new bus purchases. Once again, the buses that are up for vote um, uh, currently, that financial impact won't occur until a year out. But as for building aid, uh, once again, there should not be any direct impact of any state aid reductions made on building aid specifically. On slide Thank you. three, Thank you. Oh, a question from Jason Catalino. On slide 14, what is the total savings amount anticipated for all of the items listed? Slide 14 is the 2019-20 operational savings. Yeah, we currently estimate that those operational savings will be a little bit less than $900,000 in the current year. I have an additional comment from Pam Swanson. If potential mid-year state cuts occur, you mentioned possible cuts in custodial services. How would you handle cleaning as it relates to COVID? You know, any uh, COVID-related expenditures would be, uh, you know, pretty much guaranteed. Uh, we know that we're going to need to um, improve the cleaning, improve the uh, disinfecting. We actually started that uh, before we uh, sent everybody, you know, home to online learning. Uh, we did ratchet up the, uh, the amount of cleaning we were doing, the amount of disinfectant we were using. We came up with different methods. Um, so uh, we continue, we might not continue to do that. And, uh, you know, other areas might be impacted. You know, there's still a lot of um, discretionary spending in custodial maintenance related to ongoing maintenance projects. But anything of a health and safety uh, uh, aspect would be something that we would definitely make sure that we had funding in the budget for. We have an additional question from Kim Swanson. She states, you mentioned cuts in arts. What does that look like? Well, the arts and education budget is uh, something that we, we use through uh, the Oswego BOCES. And we are actually underspending that budget for the last couple of years. So I wouldn't say as much of a cut to the budget as, you know, right-sizing the dollar amount that we're currently spending. Bill, you're echoing a lot. It's very difficult to hear your last two answers. The question for Mr. Catalino is what increases have well, been- Hold on, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. So Bill did not come in very clear for his uh for that last question the question about um what the cuts to arts would look like and bill was explaining um how that wasn't going to be a actual cut we didn't get that response very clear okay let me say that one more time um the arts and education is something that we do through our oswego boces it's related to um you know, usually uh, a wide variety of things that we uh encourage we have been underspending that budget for the last couple of years. So all we're really doing is reducing the, the budget amount to what we're actually been spending the last couple of years. So it's not as much a cut as just right-sizing the budget. Okay. Sarah, there was an additional question. There was. Jason Catalino asks, what increases have been included in the budget as it relates to distance learning. Also, what increases have been included for teacher training as it relates to remote instruction? In terms of, uh, you know, increases directly associated with uh, online learning, um, you know, we really haven't built anything into our regular budget. I mean, we already have a significant portion of money set aside for uh, replacement of Chromebooks and, and other items that would be normally used in online learning. Uh, we also have a fairly healthy budget related to um, professional development activities. 
And, um, you know, it's a matter of perhaps, you know, shifting the focus to more online instruction, but still using the existing professional development budget. And that's, that's been, been our focus, focus uh, in our discussions with the administrative cabinet and the faculty uh, in terms of planning for this summer's work. Dr. Coughlin, our assistant superintendent of instruction has already surveyed the faculty as to their needs and requests in terms of a needs assessment. So with that, what we're able to move forward uh, with some of our plans for this summer. We have one final question from Pam Swanson. Given the potential for mid-year cuts, are you placing a freeze on Board of Education travel related to conference travel? Yes, yes we, we are, are uh, putting a freeze on out-of-state conferences, conferences for the board, for the administration, and for the faculty. We are still, depending on the budget cuts from the governor, taking a look at in-state conferences for those individuals, but all out-of-state conferences have been frozen. That concludes the input. Hey, thank you very much. What about questions from the board this time? Uh, Tim? Um, just a few things, and I know it's been a long process of development, and, and we've hit some of these things before, but just I see that as I look at the YouTube station, we got 17 people or so watching right now. With the schedule and the, the calendar being compressed for all this, in the ordinary course of business, if a budget fails, then the Board of Education brings a second proposal to the voters. Is that possible this particular year? Or if this one fails, would we go straight to a contingency budget? There is nothing prohibiting a second vote, although the deadlines would be very difficult to meet. So the governor has not issued an executive order that would allow us or disallow us from doing that second vote. But just given the deadlines associated with the absentee ballot, you know, it, it would preclude us from, from putting in another vote. So the board would have to wrestle in all likelihood uh, going to a contingency budget. Okay. And then I just want to clarify a couple of things about the act of voting itself. I want to underscore and make sure that I'm correct that ballots need to be received by and not merely postmarked by the deadline. Am I correct about that? You are, you are correct, correct that, that they, they must, must be received, received by 5, 5 p.m. on Tuesday, June 9th, not just postmarked. They can be dropped off at the district office at the secure ballot box that is at the front entrance. Okay. And the only thing that I would, other thing that I would ask be clarified for the public, not only in this format with 17 people watching on YouTube, but in general is the manner in which these ballots are handled to ensure that anonymity of voting occurs. I can understand upon receiving the ballot that there could be some concern. Here I am writing my name on the very ballot that I'm turning in. Maybe if we could describe the process by which the closed ballot is verified against the registration roll and then opened with anonymity preserved. I think that's an important thing for the voting public to be made aware of and be reminded of, lest there be any concern that anonymity be compromised due to um, the mail-in votes. So it's a great question and one in which we intend to focus uh, an article on this week. Uh, the ballots will be logged in by affidavit to identify that the eligible voter is eligible to vote. Uh, once the ballot is opened, at that point, the ballots are then placed in a cardboard box, shuffled, and so there is anonymity. There's no way to compare back to the original affidavit, but the affidavit needs to be uh, double-checked against the registry. 
I'll, I'll turn, turn it over to the district clerk. Did you, you want to add, add anything to that? Um, I think Dr. Tice covered everything. We will be opening. Oh, I'm being seen. Uh, the ballot for being opened in teams. The envelope, the ballot affidavit envelopes will be opened. And then the ballots removed and the envelopes placed in a separate pile. Then the teams will switch so that those who opened that set of envelopes are not the same as those who count them. The envelopes will be removed to another part of the room and the tallying will begin. Does that answer your questions, Mr. Prisafuli? Yes, thanks for that. And, and just, um, I, I was very confident in the anonymity and in the process, but it's very good to hear that that will be publicized as well, lest that be a concern for any of the voting public. Absolutely, it will. Thank you. Tim, did you have additional questions? Okay, Dan, I see you have your hand up. So just a couple of things. One to follow up on what Tim was just asking on the anonymity question. Uh, we all received an email from NISBA, I think it was this weekend, that had a link to clarification on how the ballots were to be handled for anonymity purposes. Um, and the, the point that was in there that was, was being clarified was that when the ballots are extracted from the envelopes, they're to be kept folded, put in the ballot box in that way. So that's another method that nobody is seeing it. And so the, 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 the more clearly that can be communicated out, the sooner the better. Um, I, I definitely have heard a lot of questions and doubts about how anonymity would be handled. The other thing that I, I would suggest as a possibility, if, if the community were to know about it sooner, if it gives a greater degree of faith in the process, is if the district live streamed the opening of it, and then they see that we are the ballots. That oh, that that would be wonderful. And if people know that, I think that's going to give people a greater degree of faith that they can actually see ballots are not being unfolded while the envelopes are there. So that would be yes. Yeah, so will good question. It will be live streamed a wide angle, obviously. So the, furthermore, you won't be able to read a ballot when it's uh, from the camera angle, but at least it will show the procedure. So the follow up on the budget specific part um, isn't so much a question, but just kind of a reaffirmation as, as Tim said, for some things that, that may not have been as clear to some people is Bill, my understanding is in anticipation of potential aid cuts, you've already factored in close to $1.8 million of of potential cuts, there was a $670,000 adjustment line that you had plus the 1.1 of items that are essentially being locked until we know what happens. So am I correct that we don't even start talking about having to do something different unless and until there's more than a $1.8 million cut in expected aid? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh in terms of what you're saying. The only thing is that 670,000, we already know of 170,000 being reduced by the state. So it's really 500,000 plus the 1.1 million in potential. So it's really about 1.6. Um, until we get to that point, um, I think we're pretty much covered. Um, in addition, we do know that there's current year savings um, you know, there is a potential for using some, some of those savings going, going forward and rolling them into next year to help offset any, any potential budget reductions as well. There's a little bit of feedback on your end. I don't know if somebody's got a speaker on or someone's got feedback when you're talking, Bill. The, um, the last question is, so it's only if we get a further cut of more than one and a half million dollars that we start talking about other adjustments, but the first line of defense on that scenario would be undesignated reserves long before we even looked at cuts elsewhere. Is that accurate? Yes, yes it is accurate. accurate. Okay, thank you. Bill, you talked about how, um, about arts and how that reduction in that budget line is not going to impact our students. You also mentioned the reduction in the athletic line, mm -hmm. but it's my understanding that's, that also is not going to be impact, um, impact students. 
I just want to make sure that's made clear to the public because I think when people who have not followed along with the process, and that's most people because you know people have don't have the time to do that, they look at those reductions and they think that there's going to be an impact to one of our student programs like athletics. Yes, that's correct. It's more uh, reductions in supplies, uniforms, things of that nature. And if a student were to move into our district who had a special need, um, the district, like all districts, are mandated to be able to or to provide that service for the students. So we would, even though we've reduced based on students leaving, if a student were to move into the district, we would then be, uh, provide those services for that student. Yes, we kind of budget a little additional in the special education area just because we know that there's that potential for students moving in. Um, over the summer that we did not know about. And of course, we do have to provide uh, sometimes the services with a, a very significant cost. Oops, okay, I'm still here. Can you guys still hear me? You can't see me, but can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, I've gone incognito. Were there additional questions from the board? Daryl, you're there on I mute. Daryl, you're talking, but you're on mute. Okay. There you so, go. Is it possible to ask Sarah, are we getting um, return ballots? I mean, it seems to me a lot of people have talked to me and they receive them and they're returning them. Um, is it okay to ask the question? Are we getting more returns already than, you know, I know we have one by the district office, but also by mail. Yeah, we have received more than 1,000 ballots to date. Good, good. Okay, thank you. Questions from the board? Tim? One more. Well, I just want to put the number into a perspective I can understand. So that magical number that it all boils down to for so many of the polling, of the voting public is how much per $100,000 home is it going up? And you said $12.74 per year per $100,000 value, correct? Right. Yes, yes, that is correct. correct. So if I were experiencing an economic hardship due to COVID, as many people are, and I looked to vote down the budget for that reason, I'm looking at about $1.06 a month of savings, correct? Yes. About two cups of coffee at Starbucks for the year? Nice job with the budget bill. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions from the board? All right, is there a motion then to close the budget hearing? Uh, Rebecca and a second from Daryl, any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye. And I don't see anyone who's gonna oppose or abstain. All right. Next item on the agenda, item 4.01 is a superintendent's report. Dr. Tice. Thank you. Uh, forgive me as I was acting as the sound mixer here when the uh, telephone call failed here. So I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, under superintendent's report, internal operations, uh, as you know, and as we discussed, the annual school budget ballots have arrived in community mailboxes, as well as the district budget newsletter. Uh, as a reminder, absentee ballots may be mailed or dropped off in the secure ballot box located in the front door of the district office. It will be important for voters to sign the affidavit located on the ballot envelope. Failure to do so will invalidate the ballot. <laughs> Under community relations, I would like to thank Joe Pachado and Jason McKay for their efforts to produce the budget video that replaced our in-person presentations this year, in particular at the two public libraries. In addition, I'd like to thank Nancy Cole and Christine Jarose for their efforts in the publication of the district budget newsletter. Under administration, as mentioned in the backup information, we are in receipt of two real property tax law 487 letters of interest for solar farms by Columbus Renewables. 
since uh, the district opted out of the real property tax law 487, the school district has commenced discussions along with legal counsel with Columbus Renewables regarding a potential pilot agreement to help the taxpayers. Under non-instructional business operations, as we move into phase two of the COVID-19 reopening, our custodial and maintenance crews have returned to full strength today. The district is providing personal protective equipment from the onset. Administrative and clerical support will return to the building offices in about a week as we staircase this in. We will issue a reminder regarding New York State Department of Health and CDC guidelines that will govern social distancing in the workplace as we gradually return to full strength. As a reminder, our food service department will continue operations and providing breakfasts and lunches until June 26th. Our food service and transportation department has also been partnering with the local food pantry and the prevention network in order to advise families of additional community supports during this pandemic. And I would like to thank them for doing so. Under personnel, in advance of guidance from Governor Andrew Cuomo, that will arrive in mid-June and from the State Education Department, guidance that will arrive in mid-July, our administrative cabinet is preparing for a variety of contingency options, ranging from the school district being fully operational, albeit with some restrictions and precautions, to a return to online remote learning, and, and as well as the many differing hybrid options that will lie in between on the continuum before those first two options. So those discussions are continuing. Under students, Dr. Kilmer surveyed our graduating class, senior class of 2020, as to their preferences regarding our commencement exercises. About 45% indicated that they would be willing to defer until July or August in order to try to hold commencement exercises in an outdoor venue. So we will continue to explore that. A number of superintendents met with Congressman John Katko today, who indicated that he would try to convince Governor Cuomo, albeit at the state level versus federal, to allow school districts to move forward with in-person graduation exercises. And then finally, last but not least, under instruction, as you may have gathered from our backup information, we held a virtual wellness day this past Friday. I would like to thank Ms. Heidi Green, our Director of Counseling Services, and her team of counselors and homeschool liaisons for their efforts to organize this most important day. Furthermore, Ms. Green and I joined in today's principal me principal's meeting, uh, thanks to an invite from Dr. Coughlin to discuss the tragic death of Mr. George Floyd and the national protests, unrest, and disorder in response to his death. We are planning to issue a supportive statement reminding students that counselors are available should they wish to discuss their concerns further. Administrators indicated an interest in redoubling our efforts to build supports and a culture of acceptance and tolerance throughout the school district. So it was a very productive meeting today and I'd like to thank Dr. Coughlin for the invite. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Tice. There was a lot of feedback on, on your audio there. Um, I apologize to those who are listening on the YouTube live stream. We'll work on that for the next meeting so that we can um, hear those of you in the district office um, clearer. Are yeah, there... Was, uh, yeah, this is the first ahead. time the conference call phone link failed, so we're operating with computer audio trying to limp along here. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Bill, sure. I wonder if you mute yourself. It might, because I see that it's switching from both of you. So maybe while the other is talking, the other mutes, it might, I don't know if that'll help. Let's see. All right. How's that? Better? A lot wow. better. All right. Technical support from Kelly. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Well, that's what I was doing from my end while he was talking. So we'll, we'll get him to return the favor the next time. Now that we're all done. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions for Dr. Tice? So I do. So Dr. Tice, as we roll toward the rapidly approaching end of this school year, uh, you've talked through this whole closure period 
of the need for significant time for professional development opportunities for our staff as you explore further online learning options on these various contingencies that your cabinet's working on for the next school year. Um, so my, my question really is, as we're coming very quickly to the end of this school year, when it is that you would be planning to do that professional development and what it might look like? I'll try to adjust my volume so we don't get the feedback. Yes, Dr. Coughlin has issued uh, her needs assessment to the faculty and uh, has a, uh, quite a few responses in that regard. We've also been working on the SOAR program, as you know, the Summer Online Academic Review. Uh, that letter uh, we proofed today will be going out uh, in the middle of this week to those families who are interested in participating. Uh, we're also in the process of advertising for that support uh, for any faculty members who are interested in uh, participating in that program. After the election is over, and not to confuse the general public, we, as you know, have been collaborating with the FMTA and drafting a survey to get feedback from uh, the families that we will incorporate along with the feedback from the teachers. So to answer your question, staff development would start at the end of June, beginning of July, depending on schedules, but it's our intent to move forward uh, during July and August. As you heard me report earlier, the governor is supposed to issue guidance mid-June, state ed in mid-July. Uh, I just worry that if we don't start to develop some of these plans now, that it will be a day late and a dollar short uh, as the summer evaporates on us. So, we are trying to hit the ground running, but as you can see, we have tried to stagger it in terms of absentee annual budget votes, the SOAR program, feedback, so we don't inundate everybody with everything all at once, but we are trying to move forward post-haste. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions for Dr. Tice? Dr. Coughlin will have a report at the next board meeting as well on the SOAR program. Um, Dr. Tice, um, yes. may I jump in about professional development just a little bit, specifically about the time this summer um, to, um, Mr. Seiberg, to Mr. Seiberg's question. Um, we always in the summer have the opportunity for teachers to uh, take FM in-service courses. So we develop FM in-service co courses taught by our instructors, and those go on throughout the summer. So teachers will participate in those, and we will be crafting those based on teacher needs that they've identified uh, and that we've identified. We will also increase the number of in-service courses that the teachers will be able to take in addition to that, teachers also had the opportunity in the summer to attend conferences and also uh, outside workshops and graduate courses throughout the summer. So that goes on uh, normally, and I see that increasing this year. And then the two professional development days that we have at the before school starts is September 2nd and 3rd, I believe it is. Uh, we will have professional development for teachers on uh, those two days as well. Thank you, Dr. Coughlin. Sure. Okay, any additional questions for Dr. Tice? All right, thank you, Dr. Tice. All right, next on the agenda is a proposed exempt session and a proposed um, executive session. Is there a motion to adjourn uh, first for an exempt session with council and then second for a executive session for the purpose of the superintendent's year end evaluation? Thank you, Sherry. Second from Rebecca. Any discussion? We're free. All those, in, all those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye. Anyone mm -hmm. opposed or abstaining? Okay, so we will take a few minutes to wrap 
live stream, go into exempt, followed by executive session, and then come out of that to adjourn. Uh, so we will be closing the executive, I'm sorry, the live stream for the public at this time. This takes a few minutes to do that. President Mims, the live stream has been closed and Mr. Budman has joined you. I will make you the host of the meeting. Okay, I still see it on my computer. Did I notice a little bit of a delay until that actually shuts down? Just want to make sure it's actually closed out. Okay, thank you. You're done. You too. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good job. Dr. Tice, the line on the, is that you, the um, district office number on the bottom? It, the phone is deactivated. Oh, it may not be on the bottom of your screen. Yeah, it is on the bottom. Let me just double check on that. It should be off. Okay, thank you. Hmm, live stream is still going. I think the live stream is still on. Yes, I'm looking at it. I still see it because I see Dr. Tice just got up. Just double check on that. Hello, Don. It's the glass of water. Mark the time. Nope, it's still going because we just saw Tim with his water. <laughs> so it's still going. Hmm. President Mims, could you make Dr. Tice the host for a moment, please? Um, is, oh, okay, hold on one second. There you go. Thank you very much.